This podcast is under a wild geese production. Stop coming. Detroit Radio. They came from the game table, dice bags in hand. We have one brain that we share between us. To talk about role playing for all across the land. And you'll like it. The original and basic that one e they scoured. You kinda grabs you by the boo boo, don't it? To bring AD and D to the second power. You want me to put the hammer down? <laughs> Welcome to Thaco's Hammer, the best damn AD&D second edition podcast ever. This is what happens when I actually get sleep. I can actually function as a human being. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what a novel you, concept, what they're right? human beings these days? Yeah, okay. how about that? Yeah, how about okay. that? Okay, fine. <laughs> Hiya, folks. Hi, <laughs> DM Glenn here for Thaco's Hammer. Flat book number 175. You can believe it? Can you believe it? 175? Well, we have and passed we the what? Oh, goodness. What? Wait a minute. We passed the 12 year mark. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Been that long. Yep. That's We've all been right. At... I can't believe I d- I've been doing Radio Grognar for three years. Mm-hmm. It's like, where did it go? Oh, Dude. no. He, he, prefers to, he prefers to hang in the background. All right, cool, you know, cool. Yeah, he, he'd rather he'd rather be he'd rather be you know the 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 silent engineer who makes sure everything runs smoothly, which is cool. You, well, by you the, know me. By, like, by the way, that is DM Brian. Hey, folks, what's going on out there? And also, the other guy's DM Corey. What's up? Welcome back. We're back. And the silent one is DM Full On Gamer. Greetings, Gamer Nation. Welcome to the wonderful world of Thaco's Hammer from the only official neckbeard in the group, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. I only have so I only neck, look like a neckbeard because neck I haven't like, shaved. <laughs> is that the politically correct thing, neckbeard? I used to say fat beard. No, People neck, used to say fat neck beard. beard. Neck beard actually stings more. <laughs> yeah. Neck beard are the guys that can't grow actual facial hair except for underneath their chin and they live in their parents' basement and look at no, hentai. hentai. <laughs> That's a neck beard. Never mind. So, <laughs> anyway, let's go to Hits and Crits. Well, one thought he was invincible, the other thought he could fly. So, they were both wrong. Son of a bitch is dug in like an Alabama tick. You're hit. You're bleeding, man. I ain't got time to bleed. We're sending somebody in to negotiate! Anybody else want to negotiate? Hits and crits. Hits and crits. Hey. <sighs> what you up to, Corey? Uh, working on my World Anvil site. Continuing growing the world. Uh, I got two campaigns running That's Tuesdays right. and Thursdays on Roll20. Just did my last <laughs> Thursday campaign. Uh, they found a mine that the fortress needed uh, to be mined because the fort is essentially old school Civil War wooden palisades, and they're like, we need stone. We need you guys to go up and wow. clear out the mine so that we can put miners in there. They get in there, and there's Durgar in there. And the Durgar is like, yeah, this isn't our home, but we're not leaving. And they're like, our home got taken over. So the players go, well, we'll clean out your house. Will you leave? And they're like, Yeah. And they're like, well, <laughs> until that happens, will you keep mining stone for our fort? And they're like, yeah. So they go over and kill the Medusa, who's running a an enclave of snake-headed women and uh, Madiar and troglodytes. Kill the one, and then another one steps in her place, and they're like, okay, the Jungle Queen's dead. Long live the new Jungle Queen. And she's like, okay, I just want peace with you humans. And they're like, okay, we'll make a deal. We're a lot allied. You don't come down and mess up our fort. Because, you know, we're like excursions out here. So they forgot that they had to go back and tell the Durgar that they couldn't do. So they go on three or four different missions. And now I have a church showing up. And the church is kind of Spanish Inquisition meets uh, the White Cloaks from uh, Wheel of Time. So they show up and go up to the mine and talk to the Durgar. I'm like, oh, really? 
Well, we've seen him in town in the last three months. They haven't been doing anything. So we're going to go over and investigate your home and see if they're, they're actually liars. Because if they are, then, of course, they're sinners, which means we then get to inquisit them. So now that the player's like, oh, uh, what? What? Um, damn, we, we, we messed up. We don't know what to do. They're like that bear from Disney. You know? So it's like... <laughs> Um, other than that, uh, working and, you know, trying to stay alive and sane in this world that we live in now. Cool. Yeah. This is why thought... you always have one player to write down the important things on one column, column A, the side stuff that column B and the stuff that you can put off until you can get to it, column C. And you tick off column A for two things on <laughs> column A first that before you tick off something on column B and before you could even look at column C. <laughs> well, the problem, the problem with it is the way I set the game up is they're mm. in the ass end of the continent on the West Coast. There's nothing. Mm. Our major nation said, go over there and build me a fort. I need an FOB. I need a Ford operating base over there on the West Coast in case anything happens. I want to have it. So essentially, it's kind of like keep on the borderlands. Keep on borderlands yep. But the way I set it up is almost like a Western marches. So there's a lot of people that keep coming in and leaving on boats. So if you can't make it for two weeks, your character left mm-hmm. or is somewhere in the fort. Oh, so the problem as far is. as... Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. What's the problem? So, so the problem is all of the players at the time that made the promise to the Duragar, there's only one left. <laughs> all the rest of them have left. So all the new players are like, what Duragar? What are you talking about? And the halfling's like, oh, um, we're yeah, in trouble. Um, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> oh, boy. We're screwed. My dog we're gave the homework. Yeah. I got people coming in and people like, I can't, I don't have time for roll 20. I got to go. Or I got, you know, my kids going to go camping or whatever. So like people jump in and out of the game all the time. Okay. That makes sense. And that's sense. the one I said, you guys could jump in if you wanted to. That way it's on a Thursday night. You can jump in for a couple hours. You don't like it. You can jump back out because it's available. And that's the way I set up the campaign. So you're just essentially on a frontier town trying to establish the outer area Working for the Ford, working for a mercenary company that is also trying there to make coin. Okay, fair I'd enough. love to, but I got my I got a Thursday game, so yeah. And oh, about that list making, Brian. The other rule is don't let Glenn do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you because you're going to get okay. Last ta- last things. time, yes. uh, yeah. what did we do? What does <laughs> spotted goblin mean? <laughs> yeah, can't, can't remember your old uh, notes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute! Yeah, I, yeah, I wrote down spotted goblin. What did I mean? <laughs> yeah, his, yeah. His notes are about right. extensive as a uh, wiki article stub. Like there's just words, and it just says nothing else. Like, yeah, nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> you got to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Full on. What's up? All righty. I'm carrying on. Got my anime watch going on. Keeping up with seasons that are closing out and picking up. New stuff is rolling out for the spring, or for the summer season as it's kicking off. Uh, still doing the trucking thing always, and uh, oh. not much else other than uh, acquiring product here and there for reference material. Cool. Just cool. you know, more anime stuff, more uh, uh, more getting more reading done to get caught up on stuff. No memos. Keep rolling stuff over in my head about uh, next. Uh, campaign adventure epic thing i want to try and wrap together into a, a tenable idea of adventure gotcha oh, i hear you sounds like fun how about you brian what's up oh uh, let's see uh well let's see for the last oh let's see two months i've been just basically working like well let's see last two months let's see march no uh, february march february january 31 28 31 that's uh, 62, so that's 90 days. Uh, out of those 90 days, I probably worked about 84 of them. Um, yeah, yeah. But the good thing is there I have part-time jobs. It's just I have a lot of them. Um, so the good, the good news is, well, the bad news was is that um, uh, the person who was working the arcade on uh, Sundays uh, quit because she got harassed by some people who didn't want to leave when it was time to sh- close on Sunday night, and it took about a month and a half to get a uh, get a replacement. And she started last week, and so I get my Sundays back, <laughs> and I'm I couldn't be happier about that because I actually can 
spend time with my son who doesn't get to see me very often. Um, aside from that, you know, um, I got it. I got up? a question. Go for it. Do you wear your, uh, arcade work? Do you wear earplugs? No, it is very loud in there. I will say, but no, I do not. No, it's not, it's not concert level loud, but it's maybe like about okay. five decibels under that, you well, know? Okay. Just, I mean, it's to uh, the point I where will. I have to, when a, uh, a customer asks me a question, I have to lean in really close to hear them, and then I have to project my voice to them, you know, to make sure they hear me. But yeah, yeah, when all the games are up and running, because we've got like, oh goodness, like, what, 40 pinball machines, I'd say probably about 35 old school arcade video games, and about... Mm -hmm. Uh, 15 to 20 like sit down shooters and Japanese imports when they're all running with the background music too because we you know our the owner has like an iPad who he just runs stuff off iTunes all the time when all that's running yeah it's really loud in there that's why I don't bring my son to, to this place because loud noises really mess with him um, but yeah so you know got that going on um I'm working on. Oh, you remember that uh, character uh, history that I sent you, Corey? You know, like yes, about sir. a month ago. Mm -hmm. I'm doing his. I'm doing his half elf and twin sons now. Okay. <laughs> and you know, so it's an interesting thing. I mean, this is like literally the oldest character I have. He's like a, a gray elf in like his seventh decade. You know, and he has a daughter from his first marriage and twin sons from his second marriage and you know he's like oh goodness what what level was he he's like what 13 15 i think fighter mate no 15 15 fighter mage that's what he is and his sons his one son is like uh 13 15 uh fighter thief and his other son is 11 11 13 uh ranger magic user you know, these are characters I had one back in my 1E power gaming days, and I decided, hey, I'm going to bring <laughs> these people over because, you know, these are people that you can run into just, you know. Yeah, as NPCs. Yeah, 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 at NPCs. And, you know, it's one of those things. Now, because I lost literally half of my D&D collection when my parents moved house back in 1994, I think, you know, unfortunately, the half that was lost was all their these characters' histories. Of course. So, so yeah. I have to reconstruct it from time to rewrite. Yeah, re you have to rewrite it. You know, recall certain things, and then mm -hmm. just go from there. So I'm going through yeah the Sargan family, and um, aside from that, um, you're just putting you know just recording. Uh, my podcast, uh, Confessions of an Arcade Addict. I just put up a video on YouTube where I did a walkthrough of the arcade I work in. Um, mm. Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. Um, there is an Arcade Addict Brian YouTube page, so it, it's there. And also in my show notes, uh, I do I did put a, a link up for it. Um, what else? Uh, I will be recording, actually recording uh, episode what fifty three. Yeah, 53 uh, right. tonight, as a matter of fact, once I get home from work. So that's what's going on with me. Nice. Nice. So, Glenn, cool. what have you been up to? Oh, my goodness. Uh, new computer, new mic, new headphones. Nice. A light for myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a Lenovo i5. Mm -hmm. Nice. Which has Intel Core, and the CPU is nice, 2 gigahertz. Mm-hmm. So uh, eight, eight, eight gigabytes of RAM mm -hmm. and a small hard drive, just, you know, just barely enough to run Windows 11. Right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and uh, what else have I been? Oh, yeah, I've got a game coming up tomorrow that I'm actually going to finish after waiting three months mm -hmm. for, because Carlos is running his Roll20 game uh -huh. in Eberron fifth edition and i want to finish my first edition game where they have they're in the damn dungeon they have three rooms to go mm -hmm. and i've been waiting three months <laughs> to be able for to three rooms it. to get finished mm -hmm. yeah yeah Plus, i know what that's like 
Plus, I've got to come up with a gangbusters game for North Texas RPG Con, which I only have the title. I've already put that in in on the website, so I'm committed, mm-hmm. or I should be. <laughs> and I've been doing, and I'm doing artwork for Mark Hunt for uh, for gangbusters. Nice. Nice. He wanted he wanted twenty portraits, wow. and. Yeah, he kind of threw me a curve. I need those 20 portraits of the guys for gangbusters, but can you make half of them female? Okay. <laughs> I do terrible females. Eh, okay. I saw that one female. It wasn't bad. Yeah, but I really got to work to I mean, okay, fine. They're portraits. Yes, headshots. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can, it's it's I the can fem- do it's the female body you have issues with. Right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. If, I don't really have issues with per se. <laughs> I was trying not to. I was trying not I, to. I, I tried not to say that too loud so my wife doesn't hear it. <laughs> what do you mean? I, issues I recommend you go check out my Dress Up Darling. It's a series that just had its wrap up episode uh, this Saturday. Uh, it's, about co- it's about a cosplay group. Uh, it will help you analyze the female figure. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you call it? Analyze yeah. the hey, I'm just going to sit here innocently and smile. <laughs> hey, there was an online game. What was it called? It was a it was a Japanese it was a Japanese game. Uh, the the something of womanhood, but and I I dubbed it bitch slap fighter <laughs> because that's what you do. You stand for another girl. She insults you. You start you start using your mouse to slap her. She slaps you. You sl- try and slap her more, and that's all. That's the game. Uh, you know, one of you wins, and then you go to <laughs> another girl who insults you, and you start slapping her. So yeah, this is bitch slap fighter. Wow. Well, fun. I, I I offer if you want me to to help. I I don't mind ghostwriting if you want some pointers or you want to send them to me, and I'll point some stuff out if you want help. Uh, I don't mind helping you. Can you write? Can you write my gangbusters? No, of yeah, course no, you can't. No. So, <laughs> I mean, if, just oh, be, yeah, if, if just Corey, get... I'll give you a word of advice because I helped him with one of his one of his adventures several years ago. Do do your best to keep him motivated. <laughs> no, I just meant if you wanted help with the female portraits, I could just you right. know if you could set it, okay. I could point out, hey, fix this cheek or raise this chin up or whatever, and just that gotcha. that way. Either well, way, I, I, well, I'm of your ghost artist. I appreciate that. I'll keep that in mind. But, you know, the female figure is the least of my problems with my artwork. But I will keep that in mind. Anyway, that's me. Let's do some emails. Let's do some emails. Let's see. We got we got a few I here. love doing emails. I know. I know. We got to do an all-email show one. We We're did. We're about to we did like two episodes We're about ago. Due. Okay. All right. Let's see. We've got one. Really? Hmm? really? Yeah, like two episodes ago. Hold on. Let me pull up the show the show notes. Uh da, 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 da. I don't oh, doubt you. Uh, just... Yeah, episode one sixty nine. That's the last one we did emails on. Oh. That was okay. like six episodes so... ago. I try to do it like say every like ten to fifteen episodes. Just to empty okay. out the to empty out do the mailbox. Do we got a lot of backlog of emails? Or no, what? actually we don't. Yeah, we're actually okay, in good shape. Okay, well that's another reason. Yeah, I'll that's another reason we don't do it. <laughs> I'll light some fires, get some emails sent to us. Okay, awesome. Uh, that would that would be excellent. Okay, first one is from uh, Stephen Moss. Hi, Steve. I Hi, think Steve. he's a new emailer to the show because his email his email address is unfamiliar. Okay, so he says. Um, the most adi- played, uh, let me try again. I can read really. I can, um, the most played editions over my life have been Beck me and second edition AD and D. Uh, I recently got back into gaming and was lucky enough to find a two E group where the DM introduced me to your podcast. Awesome. Uh, thank you, sir. Yes. And he says, thank your DM for us. Yes, absolutely. Um, he said, needless to say, I'm loving playing again and I'm loving your podcast. I'm only into the 2014 shows now. Jeez, how long ago was that? That was like the 130s, 130s maybe? I think that's without me. Yeah, 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 you were on a hiatus at the time. That was during the Civil War as opposed to me who (laughs) were around when dinosaurs were here. (laughs) Yeah, when Dirt was looking at you and saying, you're old. With you, me, and Bad Mike arguing about his router. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, the oh the oh the, the days. Yes, indeed. The, the 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 era time frame for this game for for this podcast is BB and AB before Brian and after Brian. Yeah, and I That's came right. in in episode seven. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Yeah, you guys are the you you and Glenn are the OGs. I come in in episode seven. Full on comes in, in episode twenty, and it's been that way ever and, since. And, and, the fir- and the first episode is with uh, Vince, who disappears after that. Well, yeah. of course he does. I think the first episode we have is zero. It's just you and me bullshitting. I mean, yeah. we're just shooting his oh, crap. Yeah. yeah, and explaining the segments and stuff like that. Yeah, we still have it. I can't believe what full on came in when. I think episode twenty one. I think that's when he came in. Wow, we did twenty one, ep- twenty episodes before he. Wow. Uh huh. Uh huh. I can't. I can't imagine the show without him now. <laughs> yeah. Ab- yeah. I mean, this is this is what this is what a successful podcast looks like, at least from this is the a content core. standpoint. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Everyone. Wait. That flakes in and out and in and out and in and out. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Life gets busy for you, Corey. We know. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. I call you the Zeppo of Thaco's Hammer. Oh. <laughs> hey, there's nothing well, wrong better with you, than Zeppo. Ze- Better Zeppo than yeah. Gummo. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> I mean, well. Anyway. Anyway. So, he, so we he got says, kind of yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah, we had we had to we had to reminisce for a minute because we we've been doing this for twelve years now. Uh, let's see. Uh, needless to say, I'm loving playing again, and I'm loving your podcast. I'm only in the 2014 shows now, but the one thing I've noticed is it being said several times that a multi-class character just doesn't compare to a single-class one. Oh, no, this is going to be good. Blankers, yes. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> and, and the next sentence reads, I couldn't disagree more. Uh, while you say that... While what you say holds true at lower levels, especially when a multi-class character doesn't have enough XP to go up a level yet, but a single-class character has a chance of doubling his or her hit points and have a better <clears throat> Thacko, etc. But I believe that goes away by the mid-levels. Um, the way the XP, ch- XP charts are constructed, most multi-class characters with two classes, um, multi-class spellcasters will be one level behind their single-class counterparts. Uh, when you add the ability to wear armor when needed for magic users, the better Thaco and hit points from choosing a multi-class, uh, as well as being able to use weapons when you're out of spells rather than hang out in the back without much to do. Um, I believe the benefits of multi-cla- multi-classing far outweigh the cons. Of course, this really starts coming through when you start getting above level 7 or 8. You really need a buy-in from the DM that the game will last that long. Yeah, ain't that the truth. <laughs> every yep. every person I yep. see on freaking um, message boards, it's like, oh, I'm only going to let them go until like seventh level, then I'm going to hit the reset button. I'm like, oh, I would be so frustrated. Um, another point I hear brought up is dual classing. I hardly ever saw this any in any games either, and I've only seen it done twice in very effective ways. I've seen two characters both start as, out as single class fighters that dual class into either a cleric or a thief, respectively. Uh, both times, the players chose to specialize in a weapon, a mace for the fighter cleric, and a dagger for the fighter thief. Yeah, they they weren't projecting up into the future much, were they? Um, no. I've see. always hated that level progression for dual classing. I've mm-hmm. always hated that. I'd rather I have... have split the EP. Yep, I, I, I changed and house ruled that in my world. All yeah. dual classing is different in my world. Mm-hmm. I, I don't like the way that they they approached well, it. The, the way one E and two E did dual classing is garbage. That's why they did away with it and did something different for three E. And while I am always the person who says that the multi class character in a stand up one on one head to head fight against a single class opponent does not hold a candle in their respective areas of specialty. Whether you're a mage, whether you're a fighter, their mm-hmm. numbers are bigger than you. They have more spells than you. Yeah. They have more spells than you. They have more hit points than you. They have better saves than you, whatever. Mm-hmm. I almost exclusively play multi-class characters because multi-class characters have advantage of flexibility. Mm-hmm. They have options, and yes, yep. you do that. But you have to keep in mind that you have to be creative in taking advantage of those advan- of those advantages of creativity because you have to overcome the power gap of the straight up numbers that they will have over you. They will have more hit points, True. they will have better saves, they will have spells that you can't use and they will have immunities to spells 
except for ones that you can't reach. Mm -hmm. So that is going to be a problem. You're going to have to find a way to work around. Right. But, and again, that's why multi-class I play a lot of, and 3E, the way they did the stacking of classes, it's just stacking classes and everything is additive and great, wonderful. It doesn't give you all the penalties of the dual class system, which was so garbage that nobody, nobody, nobody used it except people who wanted to play a 1E bard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that was oh, yeah, that's a whole. That was its own. And they honestly. have, and they have, and they have my sympathies. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, playing yeah, playing a bard under one e rules is really hard. It really is. I mean, to the point where they made I think two different uh, Dragon Magazine articles right. to make a bard You're character right. that was easier to deal with, and I think they took yep. one of those, uh, fine tuned it a little those. bit, and put it in second edition. I remember those. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, my whole thing is is that, I mean, I really don't care. I like playing multi-class characters, too, and my whole thing is if I'm going to play a multi-class mage, you know, I'm go- at, po- at one point I'm going to get with the other player who's playing a pure mage in the party and say, okay, um, okay, how are we going to do this? Um, are we going to keep... Uh, just do utility, you know, just do, you know, utility, or are you going to go in a certain direction, then I can go in another direction, that way we can cover the bases, and things like that. I mean, the only thing that's better, you know, it, 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 that's, that's, what he makes a good point in saying that, yeah, once you run out of spells as a multi-class character, you can just draw your sword, or pick up your bow, and continue to contribute in combat, which is, which is fine. Mm-hmm. But, you know, yeah, but my whole thing is, is that, you know, everyone seems to think that, you know, multi-class characters are fantastic. But, yeah, once you get up into the mid-levels, that's when their progression slows way down. You know, they're right. fine up until, like, level 5-5 five, five or 5-6 five, or something like that. But once you cross over that Rubicon into level 7... Going into level eight, yeah, that's when your progression slows way down, and your single class uh, compatriots start to outstrip you. And whether it be in fighting ability, uh, thieving ability, um, being able to turn undead as a cleric, or cast spells as a cleric, and casting spells as a mage. And the whole thing is, you have to kind of make yourself the the all around, you know, the utility infield, if you know, for lack of a better yeah. term, you know, and it's the it, lancer. Yeah, exactly, and and it works fine that way. I mean, when it comes to multi class characters, when I play the old gold box games, I mean, I have a tried and true uh, party set up. I have a paladin, I have a ranger, I have a fighter thief, usually a dwarf. I have a fighter mage, usually an elf a pure cleric, and a pure mage. And that way, everything's covered. And usually the fighter mage is the one who ca- who has the abundance of fireball and lightning bolt spells because he can actually venture out of the party formation and set up, you know, like a lightning bolt across the enemy's front rank and I don't have to worry about him getting, getting crushed, you know, by other, mm-hmm. you know, uh, enemies coming at him because he's going to be... He's going to have an armor class close to, if not right at the same level that the front rank fighters have. And that way, you know, you have the, that's what the utility's for. He has the, all the extra damaging spells with a couple of extra things like haste and a couple other things. And then he can just go out and just kick out massive amounts of damage either from the front rank or he can, you know, sort of play free safety and go out and do it that way. So, I mean, that's right. how I use multi-class characters, at least in, mm. in that game. Um, that's why I, I call them, go ahead. not in a derogatory way, I call them the flankers. Mm-hmm. They're, the, they're the extra ringer that you throw a wrench into somebody's plans with, but they are not the hammer that's going to pound the nail. Right. Oh. Yeah, though they they're the they're the uh the, the right hand that holds the nail so that the, the nail can be pounded in. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Something like that. Yeah. Something so. like that. I'm 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 kind of in an ad hoc one e game right now with the, my friend Jason who lives in uh, uh, New York City, and he he uh, skypes me in or whatever. But I've been playing a uh, Elven uh, 
Spider Mage. Mm -hmm. And coming straight off of Beck Me, yeah, I was disappointed. How so? The only thing, I, the only thing, I, well, what I was just, dis- I didn't mind doing the the XP and stuff, right? But it's like, what do you mean I can't cast spells and armor? I could do it in Beck Me. Well, that depends on the DM. I oh, I hand wave that rule decades ago. <laughs> I'm like, really? yeah, fighter want, mages I can want, wear armor, and I don't have like a problem a, with it. I wanted a BX Beck Me elf because they, 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 they progress slow, but boy, do they kick butt. Mm-hmm. They're, yeah, they're they front, do. I call them. The, I say they're they're front loaded. Mm-hmm. Is what I say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With, yeah. The Beckney elf. You know, it's it's basically the same thing. But yeah, someone at TSR got got a wild hair and saying you can't cast spells in armor. <laughs> Probably Gary himself, but who knows? Um, and it's just one of those things where I was a stickler for that for a long time. Then I just said, you want to know what? Uh-huh. This is dumb. <laughs> this is absolutely stupid. You know, if you yep. have if you have a fighter one fighter level as a multi class, you have the ability to use you have the ability to use armor, and that that holds over. You know, and I yeah. just said, okay, you know, fighter mages, you know, fighter mages can wear armor and cast their spells. You know, they have always been like you know. So yeah, okay, okay. So yeah, I mean, um, go ahead, Glenn. No, 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 no. I'm just wondering if he had any more in the. No, in that the that was pretty much it. You know, he kind well, of wanted you, to sir. argue his point. Wait, do I do I get my opinion? Oh, go for it. <laughs> you, 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 Hell no! You took you took off so fast I it was know. like I I I, had, I I muted myself and went AFK. Okay. So essentially, in my world, yeah, I've thrown all, all the rulings out of all of that. Uh, really? First of all, I usually start most campaigns at third level. Mm-hmm. The essentially four thousand XP. The essential uh, what what a third level fighter would be. How you spend that is up to you. Mm-hmm. And then um, if you want to dual class and do another class later, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you can end all. It doesn't mean the end all be all of your first class. Mm-hmm. You do not gain XP in that class until your XP it matches your new class matches your old class's XP. So if you're oh, a fifth level old. fighter. Mm-hmm. You want to be a wizard? Okay, you're a first level wizard with some fighting with, with really good tackle, and essentially you cannot gain any more fighter XP until you get to fifth level wizard. Right now, well, that's pretty much old school, isn't it? Well, no. Then at that point, you would then split your XP between fighter and mage. You become a multi class character. I don't stop you from being fighter. In the rules, is once you switch oh, to another okay. class, you stop the fighter. You're done. You're retired. Mm-hmm. As for armor for my spellcasters, I say you can wear anything chain and eat and lighter. That's... If you wear anything more than chain, whatever AC points that you go down by is an additional 10% spell percent chance to F up. Yeah, for spell failure. Oh, that's right. fair. Okay. That's more so than fair. So you want to wear a splint mail? You wear a splint yeah. mail. You have an AC of four. That's three worse than AC seven. So you get a 30% chance of spell failure every time you cast a spell in splint mail. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm going back to chain. There you go. You got perfect chance for casting your spell. And, and yeah, and that's oh, yeah. a that's a pretty hefty uh, penalty for one armor class point when you think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, I mean, it just and ch- and, and when it comes down to chainmail, is about as fair as you can get because, you know, w- you know, with the whole thing, with, that's one of the one reason why elven chainmail was introduced anyway. I mean, aside from you know the direct uh, take from uh, Lord of the Rings, you yep. know, you know, it's like yeah, you can. It's made a certain way that it's light and so unencumbering that yeah, you can cast spells in it. You know, and I'm like, okay. I mean, my whole thing is, it's like, yeah, good luck trying. I mean, when that rule first came out with Elven Chainmail, or even when you found it in the DMG, you can only imagine how many players were trying to find Elven Chainmail. And it's like, yep. it's Elven. 90, All of us, 95%. Uh, Elven Chainmail and Bracers for everyone immediately. Yeah. Yeah, bracers, yeah, Bracers was the better alternative, really. Because you have to, you realize you have to suck up to the elves for a very long time for them to even consider making a suit of elven chainmail for a human or much or much less a half elf. What? <laughs> yeah, if you're a fighter mage and you, you you have a good DM, if you wear studded leather and get bracers, 
you now, once you become a wizard, you have access to wear all the protective gear that a wizard can wear. Yep. So that plus your deck modifier. Yep. You should be like a plate mail wielding, mm-hmm. you know, fighter. Yeah. You don't need to be wearing oh, I need plate mail so I can go down to negative four. Mm-hmm. Why don't you just sit yeah. on AC one and be happy? Well, no, because yeah, you know, I've, there's I've some, done that it's many a numbers a time. game. <laughs> That's it's a, why. It's a numbers game. And remember, Elves, you know, they gave Bilbo the Mithril shirt. You know, he was an exception. Yeah, it, yeah, because Bilbo yeah. did a lot of good things. I mean, watch the And passed it on to Frodo. And, yep. you know, it's one of those things. It, it becomes an heirloom. Mm-hmm. It really does with your yep. character. Pass it down in generations, things like that. Right, yeah. Because you know, it's, that's it's the kind of armor it is. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's priceless. Dwarves. Yeah, dwarves. Elves. Yeah. It was dwarves gave it from the troll loot, and then he passed it on. Bilbo passed it on at Rivendell. The elves didn't give it to him. So it was technically not even elven chain from Lord of the Rings. It was dwarven chain. It was dwarven mithril. Mm, dwarven true, mithril, yes. True. But again, that's because, just, again, uh, okay. your world building crossovers are how you make it. And, you know, we're always seeing the elves go flingity, 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 zingity, zingity, boom, boom. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Yeah, and that's... again, that's why your different editions handle it differently. What are you trying to build? Are you trying to build a primary healer slash undead slayer person cleric? Okay, you can do that as a multi-class. Uh, you'll be better at it as a single class. Are you trying to be a total striker, dominator damage dealer you can do that as a fighter you can do that as a thief you can have an interesting way to do it with both but mm-hmm. one or the other will be stronger in the end than the the mix of the two how you use it is how you take advantage of it but it's not going to be it's more fun but it's not necessarily a guarantee of success that's on you the player to be creative with it well, the whole point of being a DM is to balance all that crap. Yeah. So, you know, you're not going to hand out Elven Chain to everybody in the party. You may not even hand it out to one, but still, that's the kind of thing you find anyway. Either the Elves bequeath it for you, you find it in a trove. Okay. Yep. Um, and more so, importantly, the fluff says that if you're not an Elf wearing it, they can hunt you for it, just like yeah. just like all the people who want to steal, who want to acquire a silver sword from the Gith Yankee. Great, you have now uh, given yourself an interesting character adventure for the rest of your life. Yep, stay alive. I never thought I never thought about that, but you know how many times I've had I've had players fight gnolls with a with a flind um, the flint bar. And they've gotten the Flynn bar at the end uh-huh. yeah. a lot. Mm-hmm. I yep. was thinking, like, what if the Knolls want that back? Yep, they would. Oh, yeah, they That's would. They, they refer. They no refer. Be able to wield that except the leader of the Knolls. So, yeah, yeah they revere. Yeah, they revere Flynn's. It's true. Yeah, I never thought of that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I can work that into Gangbusters, but thank you. <laughs> anyway, but, <laughs> something to think about. <laughs> Brian, yes, we got another one. Yes, we do. Okay, one this one? is from. Uh, thank you very much. Stephen, thank you, Stephen. Mm-hmm. But anyway, one more. Let's All do right. one more. Okay, this is from uh, DM Oscar. He says, okay. "Greetings, Hammer Lords. Uh, first, I must continue continue to give you compliments for the show. It's great and always a pleasure to hear the banter and ideas flow between you all. If my question was already answered previously, just let me know the splat book and I'll go for another listen. Glenn, I'd like I'd like you to know that you're not alone in your dislike for psionics. Wow." Okay. Um, there's a question which I have wanted to ask the DMs here. If you decide to use a monster that is psionic, how would you convert their psionic powers to or more normal magical abilities? Recently, I've Corey. used... Corey? Hold on, I'm not done. Um, recently, I've used the Yuan-T and an Aboleth, so to turn their psionic powers around, I just looked up the closest spell and used that instead of a, and used as a spell-like ability with limited uses. Though I would like to hear what you would do. I know the majority of you have no problem with psionics, though you wouldn't mind humoring me. Thank you very much. Best regards, Oscar. Okay. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Oscar. All right. Yeah, that's... Um, that, you know, it's like, you know... There is such the trouble with psionics is there's sometimes there's a signature thing like taking psionics away from a mind player. 
Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and Abolith is I mean, like could, yeah. almost all psionic. <laughs> you can tra- translate it into magic, but mm-hmm. it wouldn't have the same feel. You mm-hmm. don't even need to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. So, Dark Elf. Dark Elves have levitation. Innate. Dark Elves have Globe of Darkness. Innate. Yep. So all you need to do is take those psionic abilities and make them innate abilities. Mm -hmm. You don't even need to mess with psionics. This one has a psionic blast. Mm -hmm. Well, what does it do? Well, I need to roll the intelligence under... No, forget all that. Have your opponent... Have your character roll wisdom saving throw. Then you roll Mm -hmm. under his wisdom, he blocked the freaking psionic blast. End of statement. Oh, just treat them like natural abilities. Any abolite psionic abilities. Treat them like natural abilities. Give them a limit to them like three times a day or one time a day. Mm -hmm. That's where your PSPs, your points for the psionic powers come from. Mm -hmm. So once you use those three times a day, you're out of PSPs. Right. That's how I would do it. I would just, he's right, find a spell effect. But you can still use the effect of the psionic ability. Just turn it into innate ability. And give it a saving throw. That's it. That's all you got to do. And if you'll notice when you look at your... I was gonna say, if you notice when you look at your DMG and when you look at your monster manual, they have a subsection about psionics. And if you use psionics in your campaign, do things this way. If you don't want to use psionics in your campaign, interpret everything in the stat block this way and just run with it. It's mm-hmm. given to you. You have your choice right there. Yep. Yep. I mean, we're Understood. going to be addressing a monster with psionics. I'm looking at their sciences and devotions, and most of this stuff is pretty easy. I mean. One of the things is uh, aura sight. Okay, that's uh, that's an innate uh, no alignment. You know, um, danger sense. It's it, you run that basically like the uh, like the um, the non weapon proficiency. You know, you just at the beginning of a combat Ooh, round or something nice. like that, you make a check. You know, roll a d twenty against its intelligence, and if it passes, then you know he gets a bonus to something. You know, armor class or whatever it is. You know, all around vision. That just means he can't be surprised. <laughs> you know, he sees all around him. The problem is, is that the way that most of these are done is to give a, you know, to there is a chance that he could still blow it. He can try to, let's say, um, try to do ESP to you. And, you know, you're like, I don't want this. I don't want this guy to get inside my head. So you're just clamping your hand over your ears and going wah, 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 and that's your saving throw you know right. things like what that. i would do is i would say you get your saving throw you clap your ears hands over your ears and go la 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 you now get a plus two to your saving throw <laughs> exactly you know yeah that's sure. yeah because that's player sure. being that's a player being actually creative correct <laughs> but yes the box, outside the box yeah exactly so the whole thing is is that um, you just have to take a moment and say, okay, you have to go through these things and say, okay, which one is something they have to focus on, or is this something that's always quote unquote up? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, you know, once that's all um, determined, then you proceed that way. I mean, just write down some notes in your, you know, in your monster stats, say, okay, this thing is up. That one he has to focus on doing. This one's up. This is something else he has to do. Things like that. See, the only other thing is, is that the substitution for um, science for uh, psionics would be Export. the actual, um, the actual, um, you know, attacks and things mm-hmm. like that. You know, the psionic attacks. Then you'd have to like, you know, say, okay, he can do like it you know do a mind blast like a mind flare he can inflict this you know inflict uh actual hit point damage okay. on you, uh, you know. I'll be up. my whole thing is that that's, that's just pretty much how it goes it's just take a moment to just say okay is this oh something that's always there is this something he has to focus on you know this kind of thing and just go from there you don't even have to do the right. you know the psps or anything like that i just do it because i like it it's fun <laughs> for me i mean okay. i understand pete some people do not like psionics at all you know which is kind of strange but okay it's been there since first edition so you know whatever okay Oops. so you know, you know that's just how i feel about it okay thank you uh oscar yep hey i remembered oscar. it how about that yes thank you, did. you very- if you guys if you guys want to talk to us or anything like that we get so lonely Thacoshammer at gmail.com, or you can call us. 
That would be even better. Yep, number is 405-806-0555. All right, let us go on to Magic Fingers. The white wizard approaches. There's no such thing as magic. You always were a better magician. You guys than that. Whatever your secret was, you have to agree. Mine is better. Magic Magic Fingers. Fingers. Magic Fingers. Okay, Corey had to bounce a bit, so he's gone for this show. Mm -hmm. But we're still here. Hey. Three out of four ain't bad. (laughs) That's right. We're going to talk about Morgan Kanan's sword. Yes, we are. First of all, level. Seven. Seven. Yeah, this is this is one of the uh, signature Morden Cannon spells, you know, with I think the last one that we're going to be doing, which is next episode. I mean, that that's like the well, we'll talk about that when we get there. That's a ninth level spell we'll be talking right. about. But yeah. OK, um, Morden Cannon sword. It's an evocation spell. So uh, evokers can use it. Um, also, uh, for uh, it's also for force mages. <laughs> yeah, Star Wars Wizard reference. Bell, volume three, page five nine nine. Exactly. Uh, level. What does is... it say? Full on. Hmm. What's that oh, going? Oh. Full on. Morden Cannon Sword Evocation him. Force. Yep. I was going to let him give the description. Oh, okay. Sure. Go for it. You, he's got it right there. So do I. <laughs> but go ahead. Go ahead, full on. So, this is a 7th level spell with a range of 30 yards, verbal, semantic, and material. Casting time 7 with 1 round per level duration, and area of effect special, saving throw none. Upon casting this spell, the wizard brings into being a shimmering, sword-like plane of force. The spellcaster can mentally wield this weapon to the exclusive to the exclusion of all activities other than movement, causing it to move and strike as if it were being used by a fighter. The basic chance for Morden Cannon's sword to hit is the same as the chance for a sword wielded by a fighter of half the level of the spellcaster. For example, if cast by a 14th level wizard, the weapon has the same hit probability as a sword wielded by a 7th level fighter. The sword has no magical attack bonuses, but it can hit nearly any type of opponent, even those normally struck only by plus three weapons, or those who are astral, ethereal, or out of phase. It hits any armor class on a roll of 19 or 20, it inflicts 5d4 points of damage to opponents of man size or smaller, and 5d6 points of damage to opponents larger than man size. It lasts until yeah. the spell duration expires, a dispel magic is used successfully upon it, or its caster no longer desires it. The material component of this is a miniature platinum sword with a grip and a pommel of copper and zinc worth 500 gold pieces. The miniature disappears upon completion of the casting. It's a common or mon- uncommon sword. Wow. Mm-hmm. I'm, on the Monday game, my character has a dancing sword. This is better. Uh, yes. yes, it is. Yes, it is. And when you have those things that incorporeal creatures that are fighting the party, uh, we need to be able to hit it. This will do it. Uh, I'm a wizard who's lost my fighter. Well, you've got a fighter as long as it's your spell available. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. yep. and you can move. So mm-hmm. concentrate on the sword. On the sword, move around, and you are now armless Jedi. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> so, the force uh, is always with me. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, force it, unfortunately, you have to concentrate. Yeah. But that's okay. I mean, the fact that you can move around that that tells me that you don't lose your uh lose your dex bonus if you have one. So if you get physically attacked, you have some hope at least. This comes back to right. having bracers and rings and cloaks and stuff. But yeah, sure. Um, this this is one of those spells that you pull out when you don't have plus three weapons and you're up against an iron golem. <laughs> or the demon shows up. Uh huh. Or the demon or, lord shows or, up. <laughs> yeah. Or a werewolf or mm-hmm. something. Mm hmm. Uh, or the wraith or the specter or mm-hmm. the shadow. Yeah. The and phase spider. Especially the phase spider. Ooh. Yeah. Because, yeah, phase spiders can be really, really nasty if they gain an issue. Or a blink dog, but I don't know why you would want to. No. Well, you could be evil. You could be evil, <laughs> you could be evil and okay. like that annoying mutt. Poof. Yeah. But um, the fact that it hits any armor class on a roll of 19 or 20 is huge. 
Because, you know, if you're up against, you know, up against a Balrog who has like an armor class like negative six or negative seven and, you know, you're in your party is like, you know, just severely messed up and you are in desperation mode to defeat this mofo, you know, this is when you pull that sword and pull this uh, spell out. The fact that it does five to 20 to man size and five to 30 to opponents larger than man size, I mean, that can't be understated. That is massive amounts of damage. This is how you get your wizard involved in the dragon fight when the spells run out or the magic resistance is too high. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Even though the magic resistance could counter it. But, you know, any, it's, like, it's like, like I said a long time ago when I was sitting at the table at Dunkin' Donuts... And in, in an all evil campaign, and they're up fighting a bronze dra- an ancient bronze dragon who had like magic resistance like seventy five percent or something, and one of the spells got basically cast used a charge off of a staff of withering I think, and the dragon Gosh. bricked its magic resistance and bricked its saving throw. And the thing was crippled, and then it was dead. But yeah, one of the players said, "Anyone can brick a save. Anyone can brick magic resistance. <laughs> it's true." You know, and besides, okay, as a 14th level mage, how many fireball spells do you have? Mm. Okay, those are great, those are wonderful, mm-hmm. but but this will last 14 rounds. Yep, it does 5d6 mm-hmm. if you hit every round. Yep, yep, and the fact that you have a seventh level fighter's Thaco is very impressive. Although, I'd have to think about it 20. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Yeah, it's about three points better than the wizard's actual Thaco. I think a wizard's Thaco at fourteenth level is like uh, six, sixteen or something. It's like fourteen turns. Wow. Fourteen, yeah, fourteen rounds. So wow. yeah, fourteen, yeah. 14, rounds. fourteen rounds. Wow. Yeah, fourteen rounds. So yeah, so, this. Yeah, I mean, it's like can you my, get off fourteen di- damaging spells, or can you swing this one fourteen times? Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. Easy choice. Yep. Yeah, uh, this is a great I mean, spell my... to stick in a ring of spell storing. I was just about to, to say that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I mean, for sure. My, my my dancing sword goes three rounds, and he comes back to Papa. Mm-hmm. So yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, so, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. They only dance for a few rounds, then you have to. It comes back, then you have to loose it again, which is fine because don't so yeah. Swords of dancing have that progressive bonus. It's like plus one first round, plus two second, plus three third, plus four fourth. Then it comes back. That's not bad, you know. And then while that sword is dancing and doing its fighting, you could also pull another weapon and be fighting right alongside it. So and I do. Yeah, and it's yeah. That's what makes that spell awesome. <laughs> you, know? you can have this one do it thirty yards away from you. Exactly. So. Mm-hmm. That, well, so the yeah. yeah so a wizard it's got a better range better range exactly see the only drawback to it is is that aside from moving around that's all you can do is focus on using the sword that's the only drawback yeah. which is actually fine <clears throat> I mean I could see like you know a a um enterprising mage saying well I'll make an eighth level spell and call this morning cane and specialized sword. Or something like that, where you could actually... Uh, it's the same spell, but now you can move and cast spells normally. It actually attacks on the wizard's direction and does so until the wizard... Either the opponent's dead or the wizard said stop. You know, all, that's all you need to do is just kick it up to an 8th level spell to have that utility to it. That would make it perfect to me. You know, and a ninth right. level spell make it Morden Kanan's Master Sword, and now it attacks with the number of attacks of a sp- of a fighter of that mm-hmm. level or better yet the ta- or better yet it's an equal and weapon specialization <laughs> yeah see you see you see what we do with spells we take Great them and make them better googling. that's what Great we do googly moogly <laughs> no we just give we well, no, we just toss them to full on that's all we do yep and you want an example of he... this in action go watch big trouble in little china yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> Exactly. Oh. Um, oh my gosh! You guys want to talk to us about this? You can. Stakoshammergmail dot com. Mm-hmm. Wow. By the way, is there actually a Morden Canaan's faithful hound? Yes, we did that. Um, hold oh, on. Let me pull up right, the notes. We did. 
Let me pull up the show notes real quick. Okay, we did I that... believe you. Oh, we did out a while ago. Uh, there it is. Uh, episode 168. That's when we did that. Okay, yeah. I, I'm flashing back to that comedy routine of Dungeons and Dragons. You know, I attack the darkness. Yeah. Because <laughs> one of the players puts up Morden Kanan's Faithful Hound. But I had so he Morden Kanan's Faithful Hound watchdog already cast. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so it's like, God, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, let's go into Snipe Hunt. If you only had a living brain. What do you think, escape gorilla? Listen, you're making enough noise to wake up the dead. I don't have to wake him up. He's up. It's time for a Snipe Hunt. Snipe Hunt is the... Part of the show that confuses British people because they don't know what a snipe is. Oh, well. <laughs> well, or they have the internet. They can search it now. It's okay. Yeah. Well, they got their own shtick that we don't understand, so that's okay. Yeah, so it works now out. I gotta, now I gotta explain shtick. Anyway. <laughs> You're <laughs> just going deeper Emerald in Dragon. the rabbit hole, Glenn. <laughs> yeah. We're going to do the Emerald Dragon. Yes, we are. Another gem dragon. Yes. They We're... get interesting. Yeah. Okay, we got, what, two more after this? Then we'll be done? Okay, so, uh, climate and terrain is tropical and subtropical extinct volcanoes. Um, frequency is very rare. Organization is either solitary or clan. Activity cycle is any. Diet is special. We'll get to that. Um, intelligence is exceptional, which is a rating of 15 to 16. Uh, the treasure type is special, and the alignment is lawful neutral. Um, usually number is one when it's solitary, two to five in, you know, in a clan or a lair. Uh, base armor class is negative two. Um, movement rate is nine while walking. Flight is 30. Movement rate C. And burrowing is three. So it can actually burrow into the ground. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, base hit dice is 12. Base thaco is nine. Uh, three attacks around, uh, one to eight, one to eight, three to 18 has uh, variable special attacks, special defenses are variable. And so is magic resistance size is huge. Uh, 20 feet base at, you know, that's the base size. Uh, morale is fanatical 17 to 18 XP value value. Of course is variable. Okay. Uh, Emerald dragons are very curious, particularly about, Um, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Run that alignment by me again. Lawful neutral. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all the gem dragons are neutral in, in alignment. Some are chaotic neutral, some are pure neutral, and a couple are lawful neutral. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. Uh, emerald dragons are very curious, particularly about local history and customs, but prefer to only observe. They are the most paranoid of the gem dragons and do not like people to get too close to their treasure. Uh, emerald dragons have translucent green scales at birth. Uh, as they age, the scales harden and take on many shades of green. They scintillate in the light, and the dragon's hide seems to be in constant motion. Ooh, that's an intro. Mm. That that just conjures all kinds of uh, images in my head. How about how about how that how that works out? Um, emerald dragons speak their own tongue, and the tongue common to all gem dragons. And 14% of hatchling emerald dragons have an ability to communicate with any intelligent creature. The chance to possess this increases 5% per age category of the dragon. Uh, Let's see. In combat, emerald dragons usually set up traps and alarms around their lairs to warn them of visitors. They often hide from intruders using special abilities to observe and seldom come out to speak. If intruders attack or approach the dragon's treasure, the dragon burrows underneath to surprise its victims, then use breath weapon and claws, seeking to quickly disable as many as it can. If faced Which with... mean it can bur- it means, it means it can burrow right under its horde and pop out. And pop out, exactly. You know, While and... they're trying to count, trying to get the loot. Exactly. You know, they're counting, you know, gold pieces and getting magic items all of a sudden, you know, in a shower of gold pieces and gems and just pops up out of the ground roll for surprise yes um if faced with superior forces the dragon retreats and will wait years for revenge if necessary okay it's breath weapon and special abilities uh an emerald dragon's breath weapon is a loud keening wail which sets up a sonic vibration affecting all creatures within 120 feet of the dragon's mouth 
Those in the area can save versus breath weapon for half damage from the painful vibrations. Uh, victims must make a second saving throw versus breath weapon or be stunned, unable to defend or attack for three rounds per age level of the dragon plus one to four rounds. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really disabling. Uh, those who successfully Line, save... cone, or cloud? Hmm? Line, cone, or cloud? Uh, I'd, say or ra- I'd say radius. I would say radius. It should it should say that. Cone. Yeah, maybe a cone. It could be a cone. It could be a radius. It, I think it all depends. It sh- they should have. It should have been uh, said so. Yeah, that should have been supplied. I agree. Um, let's see. Those who successfully save are deafened and disoriented instead for a like amount of time, uh, and are at minus one to attack rolls. Huh, that's rather minus. I mean, rather not minus. That's rather light. I would do something a little more drastic, but okay. Uh, deafness does not protect one from vibratory damage, but prevents stunning or additional deafness. So if you get deafened, you can't get stunned if the dragon, deci- the dragon decides to breathe again. Um, let's see. An emerald dragon casts spells and uses its magical abilities at 6th level plus its combat modifier. So uh, a juvenile um, emerald dragon uh, uses its abilities and magic I- and spells at 10th level ability. And it just goes up from there. Okay. Uh, Emerald dragons are born with an innate flame walk ability and an immunity to sound based attacks. That only makes sense. As they age, they gain the following additional powers. At young uh, age, they get audible glamour three times a day, juvenile hypnotism three times a day, adult melts minute meteors three times a day. A mature adult hold person three times a day. I would switch those two if I, if it was me. Um, venerable animate rock once per day, uh, and at great worm they actually get a geese once per day. So that's interesting. Uh, the hypnotism and geese are affected by the dragon's skilled rippling movement of its scales. So that rippling effect in that scintillating. Uh, thing that can actually be used to hypnotize and to put a geese on somebody. Uh, let's see. Uh, the psionics. Um, their level is their hit dice. Uh, two disciplines, two sciences, two devotions. Uh, their their uh, score is their intelligence and 180 PSPs. Um, their sciences are aura sight, object reading, and precognition. Uh, their devotions are all around vision, combat mind, and danger sense. Combat mind, I should say. And combat <laughs> mind's actually a nice one. I like it. Um, let's see. The sciences are ejection, mind link, and probe. That's for telepathy. And their devotions are contact, ESP, life detection, sight link, and sound link. So, yes. You know, so basically they could pull more or less a, um, a Zoltar. <laughs> a Zoltar thing <laughs> if they wanted to um, Habitat Society uh, Emerald Dragons are reclusive making lairs in the cones of extinct or seldom active volcanoes these dragons are protective parents and prefer their young to stay in their lair as long as possible for mutual protection uh, they sometimes live near sapphire dragons and they fear the voracious greed of red dragons so yeah <laughs> um Emerald dragons will eat anything but prefer lizards and giants. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, and they are actively hostile towards fire giants. So there's your conflict with another species right there. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> the breath weapon starts at what, hatchling stage. It's like 2d4 plus 1 and goes up 2 hit dice and 1 bonus point per age category all the way to 24 D4 plus 12 at Great Worm status. <laughs> out of out of the egg, they are armor class 1, and it goes all the way to negative 10 at uh, Great Worm status. They start gaining their spells at um, juvenile stage. Uh, they start with wizard spells. Then they start getting priest spells at the next one, and it goes all the way up to where... They could cast up to 5th level spells as a wizard and 4th level spells as a priest. Their magic resistance starts at 15% and tops out at 50. And the XP value starts 2,000 out of the egg to 19,000 at Great Worm status. And 
looking at their uh, treasure type, they have the Dragon's Lair type, type H, times two. They have the Q, the Q treasure type, which is all gems. I think it's like one to four gems or something like that. But that's one that's Q times 18. So they have, it's mostly mm-hmm. gems. And then T, I'm trying to remember what T is. I think T is like scrolls and um, other stuff like miscellaneous magic items. So you have T times three. So, so you've got a good haul. Yes. Yeah. Even at, even at like, um, even at like young adult, which is uh, uh, age category five, they have H, Q times four, and treasure type T. So yeah, they have a really good hoard in their lair. So looking at this and look, I can see why they're protective of their of their uh, their their uh, their hoard because yeah, a great worm has quite a bit going on. That's for sure. You would have a heck of a story if the PCs ran it up against a mated pair uh-huh yeah i mean and not n- not only that mm-hmm. but what if the the quote un- what if they're a newly mated pair the quote-unquote horde is her dowry that could be, that would be interesting and of course you know the problem is they are so reclusive and i could see as if like a party's investigating like a cave system that is actually connected to their lair you know, I could see like you know, you know, they use like audible glamour and magic mouths and various kinds of traps and things like that, and haunting voices. And yeah, you know, I could see the married pair just you know, there's they're like, nothing saying go that, ahead. that a dragon can't use guards and wards. No, well, if they could cast it, the guards and wards is like a seventh level spell. They can't cast those, but yeah, Rolls I get what four. you're saying, huh? That's what scrolls are for. Yeah, that's true. So, and for this type of character, for this type of monster, uh, I could see all kinds of horrible fun happening if, say, that monster was also classed as a bard with levels, mm, okay. and then perhaps even weaponized and trained their breath weapon, and they could use line or cone or cloud or mm-hmm. just I'm an AOE grenade and I go. Boom. <laughs> and this is like all of the Godzilla Kaijin uh, friggin' tropes in one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it can that. do it in different ways. Maybe just modifying the range or modifying the the area or the shape or whatever, but mm-hmm. just keeping the damage. You know, modify the range to modify the damage or flip it and vice versa. Yep. Uh, I could see some interesting things doing with that. And of course, this is that this could be a great um, quest giver. Like mm-hmm. you're sitting there, they're intruding into the lair, and then you know they try to drive them away. They keep getting persistent. They start trying to use the audible glamour to distract, and then finally they're going to start hypnotizing people to say go away. And finally, mm-hmm. they get all the way in and say, "Okay, fine. I just drop a gius on you. I'm sending you on a quest away from here in penance for intruding on my lair. Mm-hmm. Go do something useful for me and kill some fire giants." Mm-hmm. Yeah, that or or if they're really... I know some near the demon web pits. Go for it. <laughs> exactly. Or <laughs> or if they're really upset by that intrusion, say there's a red dragon over that mountain over there. Go go take care of him. You know something like that. I could see that for sure. Just setting up oh, a yeah. piece like oh, that yeah. for sure. But you know, I mean, like I said, the this one is like for the imaginative DM because these are the ones who just. They don't want to fight unless they absolutely have to, but even then, they will just go from zero to, like, def. They'll go to DEFCON 1 in, like, a heartbeat. So, yeah. You it's want to one- know how to handle your tunneling monsters? Mark, go watch down Tremors. Daddy's recording. Yes, in a little bit. Okay, thank you. That is true. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those... I like it just for the fact that, you know, they even say that their lairs are just, like, traps and spell effects and they use their psionics to get a read on the party literally with their aura sight you know i could also see like like an like a slightly aberrant emerald dragon being like this uh this fortune this this world famous fortune teller because they have recognition and things like that you know i could see a whole a bunch of different uses you know 
you know, the usual dragon trope, but something also off the beaten path, if you will. Right. Sounds like a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> well, they, they'd rather just stay this home just and of... just hang out with their family, you know, and that kind of thing. But, you know, if there's some fire giants nearby, you know, that's what they're going to, you know, they're going to actually go and... <laughs> the fact that they eat lizards and giants is hilarious. I think that might be a typo. I think that might be. I, I think they it. meant oh, to say. No. I think they I meant to say it. giant lizards. But... Giant lizards. They're giant monitor lizards. Giant lizards. Salamanders. Mm-hmm. Uh, that type of thing. Yep. All kinds of things. What that if would he's hang having out trouble with giants? Volcanoes. What if he's having trouble with giants or giant lizards or something? He has to go to the. He goes. He lures people from the nearest town. Mm-hmm. And Gius is, um, take uh, care of this for me. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, he has agents in town or, you know, the yeah, dragon has agents in town because he never does this personally, or at least he shouldn't. That's why I said a fortune teller right. would be an aberrant aberration. Um, he yeah. has agents saying, okay, you know, there is, we have, we have problems with fire giants. They are constantly raiding our area. We want them dealt with. Can you go talk? What can you talk to uh, the next person up the chain, uh, who is another agent of the Gem Dragon? And but mm-hmm. this and etc. 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 Or better yet, if this is like the quote unquote wife of the of the next step in the chain, and that's the right. one who like you know with the with the really really pretty green eyes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, right. and next thing you know, you know, next thing you know, you guys are making saving throws because you know you're you're being geesed, <laughs> and but you don't know you're being geesed. It's like we want, we really, really, really want you to take care of these fire giants. Make your saving throw, please. What? <laughs> you yes. know, things like that. So, you know, oh, and, and just in fun. case people were wondering, the flame walk innate ability that they're born with. Mm-hmm. That's that yeah. fourth level, or third, excuse me, third level priest spell yep. that allows them to withstand non-magical fires up to 2,000 degrees, mm-hmm. enabling them to walk upon molten lava. Yes. So it does not have to be an inactive volcano. Yep. They just prefer them that way. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So yeah, it, yeah, flame walk is actually better than fire immunity, because yes, you can, you can take a bath in lava if you wanted to, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah. Fighting fight one of those is a definite disadvantage to the paladins and fighters in the party who like to wear plate and other things like chain. Mm-hmm. You know that the, the 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 hot atmosphere doesn't do them any favors. No, if they're if they actually are silly enough to go into an active volcano to deal with deal with this dragon, yes. <laughs> that talk talk about home field advantage. I've seen stupider in games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so have I. So have I. But, as I've said, this is a rule in my campaign. Macho get you killed, stupid get you killed. You want to be stupid, your character's not going to live long. And they're both boy, oh boy. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, oh, well. yeah. I mean, well, anyway, that's our... That, blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, that's our Emerald Dragon. Yes, it is. Talking about Thacoshammer at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Time to go into DM's rag. Well, that's quite a story. I think it would be fun to run a newspaper. And here it comes, right over the old plate. The DM's Rag. DM's Rag, DM's bloody rag. Leave it alone. Uh, TSR, this is TSR 9238, Ruins of Adventure. Yep. A.K.A. Pool of Radiance. Yes. This is So the... this is the module version of the... Video, the uh, computer game. Correct. This is this is okay. the actual adventure adaptation of Pool of Radiance, which was uh, mm-hmm. which came out in 1988. So this is just before <clears throat> um, Second Edition came out in 1989. Um, so this is a first edition module. I will be the first one to admit this, but you want to know what? It's still a great adventure. Um, this is. Along with, like, say, what was it? Haunted Halls of Evening Star and, like, one or two other modules whose names are escaping me right now, this is one of the better starter modules in the Forgotten Realms, you know, because this is just a great one. I mean, you are starting in a 
in a town that has been almost completely overrun by humanoids and they're trying to fight you know trying to fight it back and adventurers are constantly going into um into this town trying to help you know you know trying to help the air you know trying to help this town get back to what it was but there's so much to be done that you know it, it's it's just one of these things where you will actually run into other uh other uh adventuring parties especially if your dm has got something on the ball but so right. you know basically you arrive in flan i mean you know full on you know about this you've gone through this <laughs> yeah you know exactly about this. What? <laughs> it's the hard copy or the computer game. Either one works. Yep. You know, and it's like this is the classic trope of on the edge of adventure. Go in and clear the problem, adventurers, and more adventures Marcus, and more stop adventures. The ball, because please. it's a meat grinder. I'm almost done because it's making noise. Oh, I'm I wouldn't say you yeah, get it right. They got to start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's I fun. mean, it works. So your big bad at the end of this is, of course, Tyrant Thraxus. And he is more or less an entity who has possessed a, an ancient bronze dragon, which is a wonderful curveball for everyone for every, at, the, at the very, very end of this adventure. This is a campaign module. You know, this is one of the, this is one and as much as as linear as the video game is this one is not even though if you're starting with first level characters it behooves you to start at the beginning alice <laughs> and work your way through it um you know because you've got like let's see 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 you've got more or less like almost 20 Mini adventures in this in this uh, super module because that's what this is. Wow, you know, is it? and that's yeah. before you get to the box set pool of radiance rules ruins of myth Granner. Yeah, which is a third, which is a third edition adventure which expands on all of this. It's like the sequel um, because um, you have this, you have Curse of the Azure Bonds, and which is another one we're going to cover in a future episode because that one is actually mm -hmm. a second edition module because that came out in what 1990 i think i think it was either 89 or 90 i forget but so so basically you but you're starting off as you would with a first level party you're starting off against humanoids goblins hobgoblins orcs gnolls all that stuff because the various um blocks of the rest of the city of Flan are overrun by humanoids. And so it's up to, you know, it's up to your party to do everything you can to reclaim the town. And, you know, they basically said, you know, Flan was a small but growing city and they were doing well. And then the dragons and their armies came and then things yeah. just really started going to crap over the years, <clears throat> you know, family. This is what happens this is this uh what this is what would have happened if Army of Darkness went sideways. Mm hmm Yep. And you know, so yeah, Flan basically got overrun. You know, basically they only have like what two or three blocks of the city that is actually theirs, and then the rest of it is completely just you know that's where all the the, the uh, humanoids live. So you've got to like take Soul Soul Keep. That's like the first mission you get. Koval Mansion, then the various mansions. You can be sent on side quests too. This is this is what what's so great about this module is that you can actually make this a full blown campaign very easily, just with a little bit more uh, side prep. Because you could be, say, you're like trying to retake Sokol Keep, and you actually take care of it. You start getting a reputation in town. Then other families start coming to you saying. Well, there's a mansion over on this side of this side of uh, Flan. We didn't get we didn't get um, everything out that we wanted to. Can you go there and can you retrieve some items for us? As a matter of fact, the uh, actual game uh, will actually give you little side quests like that. It, this was revolutionary in 1988 
because not only because of the game itself, but because it faithfully um, used the one E rule set, and that's where a lot of also my campaign uh, rules came from. Because hey, mm -hmm. you had multi class characters wearing armor, you know, multi class mages wearing armor, fighter mages and stuff like that, cleric mages, and things like that, and you know, it's one of these things where you could it could you could either do it linear. It will it'll take like, oh god, what, at least 20 to 30 sessions to complete, but if you start putting mm. in all the other side stuff, you know, you could easily run this for a year, you know, oh, yeah. in real time. And not only that, then you also have um, the NPCs in town, some of them who will be allied to you, then there are other, other ones who... Um, have their own secret little uh, agendas and they're using your party to try and accomplish them. I mean, this is one of the, the one of your major um, as it turns out, one of your major opponents, although you won't realize it at first, is Porphyrus Cadorna. And he is he, and he's just a regular uh, normal human being. This is a this is a classic example of an NPC who you can kill with a sin single sword stroke, but you can't. <laughs> he has way, he's way too connected. He has way too much influence in that town for you to actually kill him in broad daylight. Now, could you, uh, could you actually, uh, do an assassin assassinate mission? Him? Yeah, you could, yeah, you could assassinate him if you wanted to, but sure. You know, but the thing is, is that he has, he suitably has, convinced everyone around him that he is uh, benevolent when he really isn't. He's out for himself, but he knows how to manipulate everyone to real that they don't know that he's out for himself. So, and they also have uh, a lot of different um, NPCs. I mean, they don't, I think they have, I don't know if they have them statted out, but they have a whole little uh section in the first chapter about all the npcs you can meet so you, now you can have npcs to um round out your party you know and they have them uh, associated oh, not associated they have them listed by race they have elves gnomes dwarves half elves humans you know it you know so you got and just like in the game, you could actually pick up two more NPCs to make your life easier, and actually that helps you out while you're trying to get oh, out yeah. of first le for the, like the first three levels, <laughs> you know, things like that. How how long does this just first to third, or does it go up further? No, this first goes to technically this goes from first to eighth. But wow, yeah. So you could yeah. So like I said, but you can go all the way and all the way past that if you wanted to if you wanted to do all the side stuff so you know it's a wonderful thing you got ruin you know got a uh, a rumor table you know they got the they, they actually lay out the entire uh section of flan that's civilized and you know it goes on from there so you got your you know right. and they actually give you now they give you the npcs the you know the the town council you know, they got, you know, like the Smithy, you know, the blacksmith, they got them all named out, you know, so it's actually an easy place for it to be a living, breathing section of this town and, you know, your base as you try it to could be it. It could be Raven's Bluff. It could, uh, the living yeah, in city. miniature, yes. Yeah, in miniature, for sure. Yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then you start going through it, you know, Soko Keep is like your first major thing because, you know, you know, basically they want that retaken because the humanoids, uh, mm -hmm. if they decide to invade the the rest of the town, they're that has access to the sea. So they want to be able to, you know, they want to just take these take the scum out. You know, so you have to do all that. But now you're dealing with undead. You're dealing with you know, uh, all kinds of different monsters, including a specter. Jeez. I mean, I'm going through Whoa. this as we're talking, so you're... that sword of Morden Canaan. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Especially at that level. Mm-hmm. 
you know, so yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, this is this is interesting. Even and they even going through like you know all these places and clearing them out of humanoids and making them run away and all that stuff. Um, and they do give recommendation recommendations. Jeez, that's a good one. Yeah. Recommendations. Make it up a new word. Huh? Yeah, I know, right? Recommendations about the actual character levels that are suggested for each section of the uh, of the module. So, like, you know, Sokol Keep is like, um, let me see, I think they say it's like first to second level. You know, they suggest that's that's the first mission, the first major mission the character should undertake. Then Koval Mansion is the second one. They say um, they shouldn't attempt this until they're at least like third to fourth level. Um, right. And they even say if your character's reached like fifth level in experience and they haven't, uh, cleared the mansion. The council will hire them to do so because they're actual thieves mm-hmm. who are plaguing the settlement, you know, and things like that. So yeah, Cobble Mansion is like a huge headquarters for a bunch of thieves. So now you got to clear them out. Then it goes on right. to the slums, which are various buildings. It's like this one section of town. It's you know where a lot of humanoids are that you got to clear those out. Then you go into the Temple of Bane. <laughs> You know, and things like that. It it just keeps going. It it looks linear, but if your characters say are like third to fourth level, they can come in and they can actually do other areas of plan before you know they go to you know take out the you know the humanoids in the first section and so forth. Um, right. So you know you've got just a lot of things, and it just keeps getting progressively more difficult as it goes on. You know, and is that is that. And then pull on Ed's the murder hole. <laughs> there is a place for it. There's it's a place relatable. for it. Yeah, easily relatable. Yep. There's a um, there's a section in Flint called Kudos Well. You can put the murder hole at the bottom of that well. The well's like in the section in the middle of the uh, the town section. So yeah, you mm-hmm. could just basically go in there and do that. You know, if if you're so inclined. If you were doing a high level version of this, of course. You'd have to up all the levels and you know and increase the monsters instead of orcs. Starting at like goblins, you start at like say, uh, bugbears. You start at oh. bugbears and go higher. Bugbears, ogres, um, you know, and just keep going up that way until maybe you're dealing with like giants and so forth. But yeah, I mean, I mean, let's put it this way: there's an adventure in here. You're called... supposed to get oh, the bugbears and giants anyway when you get up to Stonejaw Gate. Yes, that's exactly right. Stojano Gate Which is, is af- yeah, after the mansion. You start doing yep. the outside plan stuff. This starts mm-hmm. tying you in with the Zentrum. This starts tying you in with the Dragon Spine Mountains. Yep. Uh, these things can lead you all over Dragon the place. Spire. You can get lots of mileage out of this. Yes, exactly. I mean, once yes, you... a lot. Yeah, so once you get actually done with Flan, if you survive all of it, then... Um, then yeah, you actually start going out into the region. So now you're doing overland stuff, you know, and, you know, it's just one of these things where I love this adventure. It's annoying to me because you're starting off with first level characters, you know, playing the game and you're missing a lot. You know, you have to really get through a lot of, you you know, just first level character crap. (laughs) So, you know, but yeah, Stojano Gate's like the big one. You know, that's the one where... you know what... Go ahead. Yeah. No, no. You're you're telling. No, I'm just saying. It's one of those things where you just have to take care of all of these areas, and as you're going further, the the, the, uh, resistance gets stiffer and stiffer. You know, it's talking about Stojano Gate. It's like one of the encounters, you just basically just run across a couple of magic users with uh, two third level fighters, two bugbears, two hill giants and four dorgar. How about that? That's a, that's wow. a really really Ooh. tough 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 that's fight. A tough fight. For even fourth level party, maybe even a fifth level party would have trouble with this. And and this is of course the concept of no, your four member party whatever their level it is not how you play this. No. It's not how you ad- approach this type of adventure. Yeah, exactly. This is classic knock down, drag out, build you from the bottom up, mm-hmm. take all the side quests, learn all the things about the world. Yep. You know, they start you off with all the little simple things of you're going to do kobolds and, and, get, and, go- and 
goblins, and then you're going to do uh, zombies and skeletons, and then you're going to get the, hey, you, by the way, here's what an incorporeal undead is like. Hey, you're going to do some traitors. You're going to do some bandits. Hey, by the way, this is what it's like when the vampire gets involved. Then we're going to start getting into really dangerous stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it starts... Just load your... And you better load yourself up with hirelings. Yeah, that's yeah, that's why they have all those NPCs in town. And they're all, like, mid- to high-level adventurers, too. You know, like, fourth... Going, like, ranging from, like, fourth to, like, tenth. So, as you go through all of these, you know, all of these areas, and you're accomplishing all these missions, and you're gaining rep, now you're getting, you know, other adventurers who want to join you. Now, this is where... This is where no alignment spells come in. This is where knowing how to vet your possible allies comes in because this might actually bite you in the butt at the end <laughs> because um, you're waiting. You have you go through like Valgian Graveheart. Valgian Graveheart so tough. Oh, it's so hard because you are you're dealing with all uh, all kinds of undead, ranging from skeletons all the way up to vampires. You know there there are things in there that help you. But yeah, you are dealing with a lot. I mean, giant skeletons, juju zombies, um, whites, wraiths, vampires. Like I said, you know, it just it just gets harder and harder as you go on. Specters, you know, and so finally, as you're going through all these things, you have to go and uh, one of the major missions is to figure out who's polluting the river. You know, because the river actually goes through town and, you know, goes into um, Sea of Fallen Stars, right, Full on, Or is it the yep. track? Yeah, okay. It goes into the Sea of Fallen Stars, so now you got to figure out who's poisoning the river and stop it and things like that. You know, so now you're, go- now you're having to journey overland north up to where the source of the pollution is, and then you got to deal with that. And that's a tough adventure, too. It, you know, like I said, it does not get easier as you go for as you go through this and then but at the end if you have like a really good if you have if you've done your homework and you mm-hmm. actually have allies who are if not of in alignment with most of your party but something similar um basically at the end when you face tyrant thraxus who's possessing a bronze dragon basically he offers um you know, he basically says, join me and, you know, take down... Join you know, me and yeah. we can rule the Mithrana as yep. party and patron. Exactly. And your evil characters mm-hmm. will turn on you. <laughs> this is why you got to figure out who and what who and what is going on there, you know? But and you can go into this with a shady party in the first place and they just say, you know what? Good idea. Mm-hmm. Let's do this. <laughs> Exactly, you know. So, and then, and then, of course, now it turns into something else. <laughs> that's when, that's but when rocks fall. That's... Everybody dies because I get annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's... come on! We, I did good things. <laughs> I did good things. We transplanted all the friggin' orcs out of Flan, out of the Great Grey Land of Thar. I moved everybody into the Honor Rock just so that I could turn them into Fremen and keep their population <laughs> under control. There was a plan for it. Yeah, exactly. This is ruins of adventure, folks. Uh, the pool of radiant. It's the pool of radiant. And if you want more reference, you want to do more homework, or just play the game, go over to Steam. They got all the gold box games yes, now, which including you know pool of radiant. Yes, which is something I'm going to do because when I start streaming, I'm going to start streaming that. <laughs> I'm going to do the gold box really? games one at a time. You know. It's one of those things I'm going to do. I might even watch that. Yay. I I would appreciate that, that, Glenn. I would really appreciate that. That would be awesome. I'll let you guys know when when I go live. You know, Gage and Gavin would love to watch it. They're always watching live plays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's awesome. Uh, And you you know me. I can't. You know me. I can't, you know... uh, you know, I can't, you know, I can't just, you know, play a game. I'm going to be talking and, you know, recollecting, you know, games that I've played and, you know, things like that. It, you know, it's going to go and, that way. We'll go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. And, and yeah, you're going to have, you're going to have a lot of fun. Um, where can we, uh, isn't, this should be on drive through. This should be a POD, isn't it? 
Mm, print on, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, drive through on, RPG on, has it. Or the, whatever they call it, the DMs, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. The D and D part of drive through. Right. Yeah. They. Yeah. They do have. I think they have it for print on demand. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be expensive. Probably like fifteen bucks or something like that, which is close. Yeah. To you can what... always get the. Go ahead. You can always read it on the PDF. So. Mm hmm. Just, just be careful when doing your shopping research because you might run across computer game related stuff as opposed to RPG right. tabletop game related stuff. They both right. exist. Mm hmm. You know? Yep. You could yep. you could end up buying the the. PC game reference manual when you were trying to get yeah, the module. The right. Player's guide or something, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Forgotten Realms Archives Volume 2, which has Pool of Radiance in it, along with let's see, Curse the Azure Bonds, I think uh, Secret of Silver Blades, I think um, just, I'm looking at the pictures of the uh, covers. Yeah, they got Pools of Darkness in here, Dark Queen of Kryn, so all this stuff gets released on. It'll, it'll be released by this time. By the time the show goes live, which will probably be next. And week. also, and also, I think they're going to be doing the some of the later ones like Baldur's Gate and yes. Neverwinter Night, Nights. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That all all that stuff is yeah because they have all the newer versions of those games. They will go back and do this. So yeah, March 29th I is when see... all this stuff comes out. You hey, if you if you get a chance when you get it in play, let me know if they've like improved them any like you know better graphics or you know because they tend to do that with the older games sometimes mm -hmm. yeah i'm looking at it um i don't think they've really improved it really improved it but because i'm on steam right now and they're doing like this like a uh, slideshow of all the games it, it pretty much looks exactly how it how it did oh okay you know, okay. But it's good enough. I, it's probably going to be good enough to you know be in other uh, video formats. Right. But yeah, right. it won't be anything really, really out, out, really crazy. But yeah, let's look at see. Me. Collection look at me. two. Look at me. I know Steam. Uh, let's see. Gateway of. Oh, they put unlimited adventures in here. Ooh, I like this. Yeah. So it's pools of pool of radiance, curse the azure Valens, secret of the silver blades, pools of darkness. That's the whole. Uh, adventure arc for that. That's, that's they actually put hills two. far in here. <laughs> Believe it or I'm not, sure, I'm sure. I'm sure one of them has eye of the behold, eye of the beholder too. Oh, I be, I bet that's coming. Uh, they got gateway to the savage frontier, treasure of the savage frontier. Wow, that's a nice little bundle. I'm definitely getting this. Um, thank. I'm gonna have to figure out where I'm gonna get the money for it because I'm broke. Me, I'm true. Uh, this is where I'm. I'm still trying to save for Cuphead. <laughs> Cuphead. Oh, jeez, Glenn, you realize uh, now Cuphead's twenty bucks. I now. know. <laughs> Maybe next payday. I don't okay. know. Okay. 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 You know, I'm not even going to get the DRM. I haven't even played the first, the original game. Right. 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 Yeah, the delicious last yeah. course. That's the that's the DRM. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. Those the. the uh, Runes of Adventure, good stuff. Go find it, go play it, go know it, go, I don't know, just, there's going to be a quiz later. No. Yeah, just run, um, yeah, run it. it <laughs> run it for your party, yeah, you'll have fun. There you go. Oh, yeah. All right, time to close this splat book. Um, Corey says bye. Yep. So, say goodbye, Brian. And just remember, folks, just because you fought your way through the entirety of the town of Flan, and you've killed everything in front of you, and there is a bronze dragon asking you to join it on its on its quest of power of power and glory and death and destruction. Uh, remember, gold bronze dragons aren't like that. <laughs> Just remember That's that. That's right. Full on. Full watch on. your back. Watch your front. Check out below you and beware <laughs> of the. Be, just beware. You you can never trust it too much. And hey, when all else fails, when the wizard draws a sword, things are about to get interesting. Yeah. It's about to get real. And if yeah, if Corey's running the running the game, be sure to look up too. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Make sure to look up because he loves he loves up. messing with you. Yeah. Oh yeah, and I'm uh, DM Glenn saying I'll see you next time when the hammer comes down on. Bull boy. Ouch. <laughs> oh, by the way, Glenn, uh, Forgotten Realms uh, Archives Collection 1, that's all I have to hold all three of them. 
Thaco's Hammer theme is provided by the Diablo Swing Orchestra. You'll find them on Gemendo.com. All other additional music for this episode was provided by Kevin McLeod. You'll find more of his music on Incompetech.com. Be sure to visit our website at ThacosHammer.info. If you have any questions or comments, email us at ThacosHammer at gmail.com. Remember, that's an O, not a zero. You can also find us on the second edition forums at OSRGaming.org and at PurpleWorm.org. Or give us a call and leave us a voicemail at 405-806-0555. See you next time when the hammer comes down on Thaco's Hammer. <laughs>